<clears throat> well, if you've, uh, <clears throat> if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, um, if you'd like to turn with me to the book of John, the book of John. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at John chapter 20 this morning, taking a bit of a, a break from Mark, uh, John chapter 20. And we're just going to read the first, uh, the first 18 verses. The first 18 verses. Here we are on the uh, Resurrection Sunday. I'm just going to open these curtains a bit. Let some light in. <clears throat> John chapter 20, the first 18 verses. We're looking at the empty tomb. And we're considering uh, the encounter of Mary Magdalene with the Lord Jesus uh, this morning. <clears throat> now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene uh, went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple who Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. <clears throat> now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling, for me, uh, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Well, this is our text for today. Let's just pray for a moment, shall we? Father, Lord, I just pray that you'd um, <clears throat> give me clarity of thought and speech now, Lord, that you'd bless this word to our hearts as we consider this reality of Mary and Jesus, this encounter at the tomb, Lord. I pray, Father, that you'd bless your word to our hearts. Have us to be moulded and, and shaped and changed by it for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a few, uh, a few points this morning, uh, this uh, Easter Sunday, this resurrection morning. Um, the first point I want us just to consider is that uh, the Christian faith is a Christianity, uh, is a, a faith that can be trusted and Christ is the one that can also be trusted. So a Christianity and the Christ that can be trusted. Here we have um, the ladies coming to the tomb and seeing it, uh, first of all, uh, being empty and then uh, having this encounter. We don't actually see in this account today, but if you read the parallels, they have an encounter with the angels, then they go away and they get the disciples. And as we've just read, Peter and uh, John uh, come to the tomb uh, we see Peter being outrun by John and they reach the tomb again Then they look in, they don't see anything, so they go away. And then we see this encounter that Mary has again with the angels 
uh, asking uh, concerning Jesus' body. And then uh, at the end part of our text to say, today, we see Mary having this encounter with the Lord himself. The resurrection, the resurrection. Why is the resurrection so important uh, for the Christian faith? There's lots, of, there's lots of resurrection proofs that we could discuss today, but we're, I really want to just drill down and focus on our, our current text. There's different, there's different uh, evidences for the resurrection, such as the Roman, uh, the Roman guards, uh, the eyewitness accounts, uh, we've seen Jesus, um, the, the, the New Testament speaks of how Jesus appeared uh, on many different occasions. Uh, one particular occasion, uh, 500 plus people saw uh, Christ in his resurrected, resurrected form. This was uh, before he ascended up to the Father. We, we see him speaking with his disciples. We see him walking on the road to Emmaus. We're going to touch on a little bit of that in just a moment. Uh, having food with them. Uh, eating breakfast with them and so on and so forth. But let's just consider our, our text for, for today. Our text for today. Uh, Peter uh, coming up to the tomb and <clears throat> we see in verse 7 there's this, uh, well actually let's go back to verse 6 and then Simon Peter came uh, following uh, John and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there, verse 6, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths but folded together in a place by itself. Now some people um, like to combat the, the evidences for the resurrection and the Christian faith by saying well Jesus's body was stolen by grave robbers, it was taken. Um, but you can see here uh, this, you know, what one, one kind of uh, aspect here of the, the folding of grave clothes and uh, the, the, the handkerchief that covered his head was folded neat, nice and neatly put down. The grave clothes were still there. If someone was going to go and rob a body that had been in the grave for a couple of days, you know, they wouldn't be untying the, the body of grave clothes and leaving the, leaving the linen cloths there. But they would just be taking the whole, the whole body with them, including, the, including the, the actual linen cloths that were with them. Um, just as a side note, um, often you see on films or whatnot the, the, uh, the linen uh, kind of lying on a floor in some kind of way as if Jesus kind of by, in some kind of miraculous sense came through the cloth and it's lying in the shape of his body. But the Bible doesn't actually give us that uh, picture. Uh, in fact, the fact that it was taken and folded neatly would suggest that Jesus maybe, I mean it's speculative, but maybe he unraveled it himself and took it off and folded these things neatly. We don't know for sure, but just something to be, to be thinking about really. Um, we see ladies coming to the tomb first. This is a big uh, evidence with regards to the resurrection. Which ladies? Now again, the parallel accounts differ. They, you, some have certain ladies in, some have others. Um, we know there's a lady called Joanna, the wife of uh, Chusa, who was a steward to King Herod of Antipas. There's Salome, the mother of James and John. Those are the sons of Zebedee. Um, then there's several Marys for us to contend with. We've got Mary Magdalene. She's the first lady who saw Jesus' resurrected body. Then there was Mary, Jesus' mother. Mary, who was married to Clopas, um, who, who believed that... Uh, uh, historian Eusebius believes that Clopas was Joseph. That's Jesus' stepdad, in a sense, his adopted father. He, um, that's, uh, that's his brother. Uh, Clopas was Joseph's brother, so it would be, it would be Jesus' auntie, another Mary. And then uh, there's another Mary, uh, the mother of James, the younger, and jo Joseph, who, as we read of today. So there's several, several Marys there. But what's the point of, of all this with regards to all these ladies? They came to Jesus to uh, anoint his body to, 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 um, uh, to the tomb early in the morning. It was still dark. But the point is that they were all women. They were all women. Um, why does that make the evidence stronger for the Christian faith, the fact that they were all women? Well, if anything, in the first century, if you wanted to fabricate a lie or to orchestrate some kind of conspiracy, you wouldn't use ladies, because culturally speaking, uh, back in those days, the testimony of ladies wasn't considered to be as credible as the testimony of men. Um, so it would be the worst way to try and fabricate some kind of hoax, some kind of fraud, to use ladies to go and to, and to have ladies give this first account of an empty tomb and of a, of a risen saviour, it, um, it would be the wrong way to do things in the first century uh, Jewish culture. What we see from this is that not only is God true, but you know, God doesn't, he doesn't uh, placate to cultural ideas, to political correctness. You know, he wasn't trying to 
uh, just think, well, we better just make sure it's men that uh, see the, the risen Savior first because obviously the account will be believed then thoroughly. You know, God isn't a pragmatist. He doesn't bend to the culture uh, of the day. And we can think about that in our, own, in our own situation we're in here today. There's lots of things that people uh, are, are doing in the name of Christianity. They're trying to bend the truth of God to, to fit into the culture around them, trying to be uh, making Christianity culturally relevant, uh, politically correct, and so on and so forth. But that's not how God works. Truth isn't defined by what the culture thinks. You know, in the, the culture in Noah's day was that... Um, you know, no one was going to be getting on that ark. The flood wasn't going to come. Uh, but you see, Noah was right. Noah yielded to the truth of God, and, and the whole world was wrong. God, God isn't, um, he doesn't just uh, operate in, in order to please the masses, so to speak, or to be culturally uh, uh, relevant. In fact, if anything, God often uses things which are completely culturally ir irrelevant. He uses the weak and the, the, the feeble and the foolish to shame the wise and so on and so forth. But we see here that this resurrection has credibility to it. We see that it proves that God is the God of truth. God is the God of truth. We have these Old Testament predictions, Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in shell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. We see these Old Testament predictions of the Messiah uh, not being allowed uh, to have his soul left in shell, but to be ri risen from the dead. Uh, and then we see uh, in the New Testament, we see Christ himself uh, as th those of you who have been here for the Mark sessions as we've gone through Mark, we've seen these three predictions that Christ has given to his disciples that the Son of Man was going to be betrayed, handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, who was going to be mocked and, and scourged. This process of scourging, for, the, for those of you who were here when I preached about that, this process was a, it was a Roman, it was a Roman uh, uh, process to scourge someone. Jesus even, he even uh, <clears throat> predicted not only about his crucifixion, but about how that was going to happen, that it was going to be at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes, and it was going to be a Roman crucifixion, and so on. And then, he, and then he would say to his disciples, and then on the third day, the Son of Man is going to rise from the dead. He predicted these things. And now we see this empty tomb, which shows us that God is true, that God is the one who can be trusted as the, tr the tr one true God, the one true God. You know, the resurrection is so, it's so fundamentally important to the Christian faith. <clears throat> Just as much as the, the cross of Christ is so important, so too is the resurrection. Without the resurrection, biblical Christianity falls apart, so to speak. It crumbles from the foundations upwards. It's like going to a brick wall and pulling the brick from the bottom of the wall. The wall's going to fall down because if the resurrection's not true, then the cross, in a sense, is meaningless. It's just another dead religious leader in the grave who's led himself and many others astray and led himself to his own demise. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. <clears throat> you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have, we have hope in Christ, we are men of... sorry. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we, are, we, are, we of all men are most to be pitied. So the Apostle Paul says, if the resurrection has not taken place, then our faith is futile. And we of all men are the most to be pitied. If we're following a saviour that is, that is still dead in the grave, then what good is that to us as Christians? Our faith is futile. The resurrection of Jesus uh, is what the Christian faith hinges upon. It's what we're celebrating this morning, this reality that he is risen from the dead. He's defeated sin and death and the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. Sin could not destroy him. He rose from the dead. And you know, when you look through the book of Acts, you see, often around us today, we see the gospel preached and we hear people preach about the death of Jesus, and rightly so. That is the central theme of the gospel when it is preached. But when you see the book of Acts and you see the preaching of their disciples, they preached heavily on the resurrection. They preached heavily about this man who's risen from the dead. And it's so vital because if he hasn't risen, then everything he taught and everything he stood for and the death that he went to at the cross was in vain. But praise be to God that he is the risen king, the risen saviour. Sometimes um, 
when you, if you're dealing with people that are following other religions, maybe uh, Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses and so on, you know, I'll talk to them respectfully and I'll say, you know, you can go to Medina and you can, you can see Muhammad's body is in a tomb. It's in a tomb at the Green Dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia. It's still there in the tomb. Allegedly, it's still there. You can see these religious leaders that, that, that they, they lead themselves and others to, to their, to astray. They go to their deaths and they're still men that have got bones and flesh and they're in their graves. And then I've said to people in the street sometimes, I remember saying to a Muslim once, can you tell me where Jesus' body is? And he was like a rabbit in the headlights. He, was, he just realized, like it's not in the grave. He realized that you can't find it. Sometimes you could say to people, I challenge you to take all the, all the world's leading uh, historians and geologists and scientists and go and look for Jesus' body. Go and have a look for it. You won't find it anywhere because he's no longer in the grave. God is the God who is true. And the resurrection is that it gives validity to the Christian faith. Christ is the Christ who can be trusted. He's the Christ who calls his people. He's the Christ who calls his people. Now, we see sometimes the call of Christ is sometimes rejected. It's sometimes rejected. What we don't see from today's account, I'm going to be dipping in and out of the parallels to, to some extent, just to kind of... Um, uh, bring something new and fresh out for us today. What we don't see today is the, uh, <clears throat> the reaction of the soldiers when they saw the, the angels at the tomb. Um, in Matthew 28 verse 4, it says that the soldiers, they shook with fear and they became like dead men at the presence of these angels. And then later on in, in various accounts, we see how the soldiers, they went away and they took bribes to stay quiet. They'd seen these angels, they'd seen the tomb empty, they'd seen these supernatural beings to the degree where the, their fear caused them to become like dead men, but yet they still took these bribes from the leaders in order to not uh, expose this reality of Jesus rising from the dead. So we see a call here that was, that in some ways, it's a call that's given, but it's a call that's rejected. And we see that all around us in the world today. We see men and women who reject the, the reality of the risen Christ. They reject the reality. They may not have been at the tomb as the soldiers were, but they hear the message of Christ. They, they, they consider the season of like, uh, uh, that we're in now, the, the Good Friday and the Easter Sunday. They consider this time of year, but they reject it. They reject it when they say, well, that, that might just be something that Christians do, something that they've made up, something that, they, that they've fabricated or, you know, yeah, but they've never really considered Many, many people have never really considered the reality of the resurrection. <clears throat> it's a call from Christ which is confirmed. It's confirmed. You see, at first the ladies brought this account to the disciples. And the disciples didn't believe it. In Luke 24, it says, when the ladies came to them and spoke with them, it says that their, that their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. And then they ran to the tomb, and we see Peter, he looked in, he saw the linen cloths, and he departed. In, in Luke, it tells us he departed, and he was marvelling to himself what had happened. And in today's text, we see that they went in, the two disciples, and they looked in the tomb, and they saw, and it says in verse 8, they saw and they believed. There's a sense in which they believed the tomb was empty. But at that point, they didn't truly understand. If you look in the very next verse, verse 9, for as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes, verse 10. They were confused. There was much confusion, confusion concerning what was going on with regards to the resurrection of Christ. Even though he had told them three times that we have recorded to us that he's going to rise from the dead, they saw this empty tomb. They still didn't understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. We know later on in the day, remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears to these two disciples. He meets with them. Uh, the Bible tells us their eyes were restrained from knowing who he was. Perhaps in some way similar to Mary today in the account where she thought he was the gardener. He begins to speak with these two, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He asks them, what, what conversation are you having? Why are you sad? 
And uh, one of the disciples responds to Jesus, Are you the only stranger in, Jerus in Jerusalem? Have you, have you not known the things uh, which happened in these days? It's interesting. I always find that comment, that comment quite uh, interesting. I bet he was kicking himself after that. Here he is saying to Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know what's been going on? He's, he, and then he realises later on that it's Jesus. And he must have felt like, you know, it must be one of those moments thinking to himself, I can't believe I said that said that to Christ on the road but when we see Jesus walking with them and he says to them oh foolish ones and slow of heart to all to believe that all of all that the prophets have spoken ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and then I want us just to think about this for a moment with regards to the call of Christ the call that's confirmed he turns to them and he says and it says beginning at Moses beginning at Moses and all of the prophets he expounded to them in the scriptures all things concerning himself. So Jesus began to speak to them, expounding the scriptures to them. He didn't just appear and say, look guys, it's me. Look, it's me. I'm, I'm here. I've risen. Now later on, we know when he broke the bread, his identity was revealed to them and then he, and then he vanished in front of their eyes. He, he literally reveals his identity and then vanishes. But at this point on the road, do you remember it says that their hearts burned within them as he was speaking with them? He was using the words to confirm this reality of his resurrection. And he does this later on as well with the disciples. He meets the disciples that very... Uh, so on the road to Emmaus, he reveals his identity. Those two run back to Jerusalem. So it's like a seven mile, I think it was about a seven mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they run back, they speak to the disciples. And as they're speaking... Jesus appears to them as well and he appeared to them and he said to them in Luke 24 these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me and then in Luke chapter 24 verse, verse 45 it says and he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures then he said to them thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. So what's the, what's the crux of what I'm saying here is that, yes, Jesus has risen. Yes, his resurrected body, for example, Mary, she sees him, she embraces him. She, she believes that, that, that he's risen. But that it's got to be something more than that. It's something that God does through his word. He opens our eyes as we understand the scriptures. We need to have our eyes opened. Jesus was one that would preach out of the Old Testament. We know that when he was in ministry, he would preach. He wasn't just giving his opinions. He was preaching the word of God out of the scriptures. <clears throat> Notice how it says that he opened their understanding. He is the one that does it. It is Christ that opens our understanding. There's no doubt that the Christian faith is an experiential religion. It's something that we experience. We experience that walk with Christ. We experience that saving power of God in our lives. But you know, our experiences can be wrong. They're, our experiences are, are fairly subjective. What one person may experience may not be something that someone else experiences. But this is why the word is so important because the word of God is true. The word of God is immutable. It's unchanging. It's fixed and firm. You hear people all the time say, oh yeah, well I feel God's telling me this and I feel God's telling me that. And that, that may be something that the Lord's doing, but we need a chapter and verse attached to these things. We need to receive uh, understanding from the scriptures as it's opened up in our hearts, as the Spirit of God works in our hearts, as we come to the understanding of who he is and what he's done for us uh, in regards to the scriptures. There's a, a preacher out there at the moment, a man called Andy Stanley, you may have heard of him, he's the son of a, ma a, a pastor called Charles Stanley. Um, just a warning really, the guy is, is quite a dangerous individual and uh, he basically says, you know, we don't need to uh, re um, consider the, the realities of the inspiration of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture, we just need to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and everything else hinges off of that. Now, it doesn't take long when you think about this logically to realise that where do, we, where do we hear about Firstly, where do we hear about Jesus being risen from the dead? We hear it from the scriptures. It's the scriptures that testify to the risen, uh, na to the nature of Christ's risen, um, <clears throat> his resurrection. 
And it's not just the reality that he rose from the dead, but we need God to work in our hearts by the power of his word in our lives that we would come under the authority of the scripture. So it's a call that is confirmed by Christ, and it's a call of Christ that is heard by those that he knows. Then what do I mean by that? It's a call of Christ which is heard by those that he knows. We see Mary in our text today, verse 13. <clears throat> we see her weeping. This is her second encounter with the angel. She's gone back to the tomb. She's weeping, and they, they ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? This is, a, this is a mild rebuke in some ways. It's a question, but it's a mild rebuke. Woman, why are you weeping? Who are, who are you seeking? What were you, what were you expecting to see when you came here to this tomb today? Who were, you, who were you hoping to find today? They'd already expressed that he's risen earlier on. We don't see that in John's passage, but we see it in the parallels. They've expressed that he's risen. Clearly there's some confusion here. She's speaking to the angels. They've, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. You can just see this picture of her stooping down, looking into the empty tomb. The sun's coming up. It's probably well up by now, looking down into the tomb, tears filling her eyes, broken. This one who we've been following for years died on a cross and now his body's gone, lost, confused. He's died on the cross. We came to anoint his body and now if things, as if things couldn't get any worse, he's, he's gone. He's gone. What a picture. What a picture of brokenness, lostness, desperation. We can often be like that, can't we? We're, we're often slow in heart to believe. We're often doubtful, full of fears. God, where are you in this? God, what about your promises? We often forget the promises of God, let alone reject them. Slow to believe the promises of God in Scripture and his goodness towards us, slow to believe the reality that he's working all things together for good for those who love him and accord, accord, according to his purposes. But then she turns. She sees the one who she believes to be the gardener. Maybe her eyes are restrained like the, men on the, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Maybe her eyes are full of tears. She can't quite see him, can't quite see who it is, perhaps. Maybe the, maybe the light's not quite right. Maybe he'll know. I'll ask him. I'll ask the gardener. If you've carried him away, please tell me where you've, let, where you've laid him. Mary. Her heart races. Maybe she struggles to catch her breath. She turns to him. Rabboni, Rabboni. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. She hears him call her voice. Mary and it's at this point she recognizes who he is what a picture we see here of a soul that is called by God someone who's been called by God by name what a wonderful reality here's one who's been called personally Mary put your name there Scott Philippa Kathleen Claire all of it we could say each one of us Peter we put our names there what a wonderful reality to each one of us as believers. We're called by God personally. Mary was called by him. He calls to us to know him personally. He calls her name personally. To be known by God intimately. Not just as an acquaintance. Not just as a friend. Not just as some distant uh, relative. But, but to be known as a child of God a son or a daughter of the living God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the Apostle Paul writes, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. You see, the Christian faith is not just, it's not so much about us knowing God. The Christian faith is the reality that God knows us. Now, of course, God knows everything, right? He knows all, all people. He knows uh, every single human being that he's made and he knows them intimately. 
but he knows Christians in a, in a very special, unique way. He knows us as he, as he is the Father and he knows us as his children. It's interesting, isn't it? We live in a world today where everybody wants to be known. Everybody is plastering their face over the internet. Everyone want, there's a lot of people who want to be celebrities. We live in a celebrity culture. We want to make ourselves known. But you know, some of God's choicest saints are, not, are pretty much nobodies in the eyes of the world. They're nobodies. I think it was Paul Washer, someone said to him, who's the most godly man you know? And he said, he said You'd never, you wouldn't know him. You've never heard of him. It's not a celebrity. It's not someone who's got a YouTube channel. It's someone who's tucked away with God. Someone who's known by God. And someone who knows God intimately. Here's Mary. She's known by Christ. A lady who historically had a, quite a questionable background. Delivered from seven demons. A follower of Christ. Mary knew his voice, but more importantly, he, he knew her. Have you experienced that? Here's the question for us today. Have you experienced God in that nearness, in that way of him knowing you? Has he called your name personally, if I could put it like that? I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about that audible reality of Christ's voice. She heard an audible voice. But does, do you know that God knows you, so to speak, in that saving way? Have you understood that? Have you received that salvation? Have you looked to Christ and beheld him in that same way? Teacher, Rabboni. You see, there's a lot of people who confess to know God and confess to be known by him that actually aren't. Do you know Matthew? Remember the Matthew 7 passage? <clears throat> the Matthew 7 passage. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many mighty wonders in your name and then I will declare to them says Jesus what does he say I never knew you I never knew you now of course he knows them he knows them in a way that they're going to be judged and receive judgment but to know God in that saving way to know him in that saving way so he calls us to know him personally he calls us to live under his authority Mary at once responded. She hears her name called and she responded, Rabboni, which is translated teacher, master. See, the Bible tells us that his sheep, his sheep hear his voice. John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, the Lord says, my sheep hear my voice and I, and I know them. You hear that again? And they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. You see, his sheep hear his voice. Mary heard his voice. She heard that one who knew her, and in turn it reciprocated her allegiance. She, she submitted to, to his authority, uh, acknowledged him as teacher and master, and her life was changed. She turned, we see this picture in, the, in our text today of her turning to Christ when he calls her name. What a wonderful picture that is of the Christian life. Christ calls us in a saving way and you see men and women turn from sin and turn to Christ. You see, to turn from the world, there's only one true way to turn from the world and that is to turn to Jesus. And we see Mary turning to him in that saving way. What does it look like to turn to Jesus? It, it looks like obedience. It looks like turning from the world. It looks like yielding to the will of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. He who says that I know him, talking of God, he who says that we know God and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. You know, we, there's a lot of people out there today that say, yeah, I know God, yeah, I know Jesus. And they're living lives of selfishness. They're living lives of sinfulness. They have no regard for purity and holiness. And the Bible tells us that they're, that they're self-deceived, that they're liars and the truth isn't in them. That's on, on the authority of the scriptures. Now, is it, is it possible for Christians to, to fall and to flounder and to fail time and time again? Yes, it's very possible. But if, if a person professes to be a Christian and they live in a continual state of slavery to sin, and they have no victory and power over the sin that they know is wrong 
and they're in deliberate rebellion to God in a continual sense. It's evidence that they don't truly know him in that saving way. So is the Christ who calls his people personally, <coughs> the Christ who calls his people to live under his authority, and then we see the reign of Christ as firstly the victorious king. Mary realises this is Christ and she tries to touch him in some way. We don't know how that quite looked. Maybe she grabbed, grabbed his clothes or grabbed hold of his arms or we don't know. But he says, don't cling, do not cling to me, verse 17. Do not cling to me. Now there's some people who say, well he said that because he hadn't yet, he hadn't yet ascended to the, to the Father. Uh, and this is this kind of 40 day period between the resurrection and the ascension. Um, however, we do, we see other examples in the scriptures of people touching Jesus in the kind of intermediary state, if I could put it like that, between the resurrection and the ascension. We see other people touching him. Uh, in Matthew 28, you don't need to turn there, but feel free to take a note of the verse. Matthew 28, verse 9, the women uh, who also saw Christ, they came and they held, it, uh, they held him by the feet and they worshipped him. We see, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, the road to Emmaus. They sat and they ate food with him. And then he later, he later appeared to his disciples, Luke chapter 24, verse 39. And he actually says to his disciples, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. He says, Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, uh, flesh and, flesh and bones as you see I have. And then we know about Thomas, doubting Thomas. He says, Reach your finger here, look at my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. He actually wants to encourage Thomas in his faith by getting him to touch his body. So what is it here about, about Mary saying, don't, don't cling to me, Mary. Don't cling to me. <clears throat> well, I think there's a very real sense in which things are different now. Things are different now. I'm going to be with you, but in a different way. This is now the time where my people will walk by faith and not by sight. Again, the road to Emmaus, he breaks the bread in their, ha in their home. His identity is revealed to them and then he's gone. He's gone out of their sight. I mean, that's strange, isn't it? When you think about it, he's with them on the road. He's speaking with them. Their hearts are burning within them. He goes, they ask him to come and eat with them. He goes in. He breaks bread, showing the authority of the one who's overseeing the meal. And then, he, and then his identity is revealed to the, the disciples and then he vanishes. See, we have a Christ here who calls us to live now by faith and not by, not by sight in that same way. The disciples, they're, they're no longer going to be sitting around and, 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 and musing with Christ and laying their heads on his breast in the same way as they travel together, hearing the stories from Christ in the same audible way in a continued uh, 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 state that they had been doing during his ministry, sharing rooms together, getting into the boats together, crossing Galilee and looking at Christ as he's asleep in the stern of the bow with his, um, uh, the boat with his head on a pillow, so to speak. Something even greater has happened now. Something of a new chapter is taking place that Christ and the Father by the Spirit will soon be dwelling inside of the believer the birth of the church, that men and women will have God come and live inside of them and will walk this Christian life by the eye of faith, being used by God, all of us becoming more like Christ, being fashioned into, into the image of Christ, being his hands and his feet in the earth, being his voice upon the earth in this great commission work that's been happening over the last 2,000 years. God reaching the nations by his spirit through his church. He says to Mary, don't cling to me in this same way, in this same way that we walked before my death, my resurrection. Don't cling to me in that same way. Not, not that he's no longer going to be with them. Of course, Christ is with his people by his spirit, but in a new way. He's no longer a man who's subject to suffering and betrayal. No longer a man who, re who experiences temptation uh, in that same way that he did. He's a man who, you see, he wasn't like Lazarus being resuscitated back on this side in order to die again. 
But the resurrection is something very different. The resurrection is Christ passing through that veil of death and rising again on the other side, no longer subject to the same earthly uh, uh, inhibitions that we are, so to speak. He won the victory at Calvary. He's received this new resurrection body which is soon to ascend to the Father in full glory. What a saviour. He says to Mary, don't cling to me. We see the reign of Christ as the victorious king, but also as the ascended king. Let's just speak about that verse 17 for a moment. He is, he is soon uh, to ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. Firstly, let's just think about this. He ascends, it tells us. <clears throat> he says, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. And then he says, but go and tell my brethren and say to them, I, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. This one who first descended down to earth, condescended to come into creation as a human, humbled himself, the creator of the universe, becoming a small child in the arms of a young Jewish virgin Mary, humbling himself and knowing what it is to feel suffering and, and grief, in a, not in a sinful way but in a pure way. He's soon to ascend back to his father. This God-man, Jesus Christ, goes ahead of us. He says, to my God and to your God, to my Father and to your Father. He's not only risen from the dead, but he's soon to be ascended in glory, soon to be coronated. You know, we've got the coronation coming up in a few weeks of the King of England. It's one thing for a king to step onto a throne and to receive the coronation at the hands of earthly men, but Christ himself has been coronated the King of all kings, and the Lord of all lords, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, being given all rule and all authority and all preeminence and power belongs to this Christ, this God, man, Jesus. He ascends, and he ascends as the eternal Son of God. He says, to my God and to your God, to my Father and to your Father. There's a sense here in which he's making a distinction. Yes, the same God of Christ is our God, the same Father of Christ is our Father, but there is a very unique distinction that needs to be made. Jesus' relationship with his God and his Father is not the same as ours in the sense that Jesus has co-equally, co-eternally existed with God the Father from, from the beginning to the end. There's never been a moment of that separation from eternity past to that eternity future, so to speak. He was the one who existed with the Father in glory before the world began. The one who is preeminent first in all things. Everything the Father has ever done has done it. He has done it for his Son. So Jesus rises as God in the flesh, the man and the God-man. But he rises in a, a very distinct way, in a unique way to what we do. We, are, we came into existence 42 years ago, whatever it may be. We came into existence at a certain point in time. Jesus has always existed as God. He's the one who has the divine power to lay his life down and to take it up again. As he says in John 10, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. None of us have the power to do that in our own power, our own strength, but only in the power of God. I don't want to go read too much into this, but we see, we see in our text today, uh, verse 12, uh, we see the angels, one seated at the head, or sorry, what, uh, uh, yes, they, they were sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. There's some people, as I, as I was looking into the sermon and preparing for today, some people speak of the, the picture there, the Ark of the Covenant. You see these two angels, one on either side, covering the, the throne, the mercy seat. Now, I don't, again, I don't want to read too much into that, but you see the authority of Christ here, these angels, one at his head and one at his feet. 
this picture of a mercy seat, this, this risen saviour who died and was buried in the, gr- in the grave, dealing with sin and death and judgment, is now risen, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So he's risen with a distinctness and a uniqueness, the Son of God, eternal, with the Father, but he's also ascended as our elder brother, our elder brother. He says, my father and your father, my God and your God. We see Jesus, the man, God the Son becoming a human being and living amongst us in the flesh, without sin, without the sin nature, living the perfect life. He calls his father, he calls him God. We saw on the, in the reading earlier, Jesus on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He walked as a human being in the power of his God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, operating as a man. Of course, fully divine in nature, but also fully human. Jesus, our elder, bro- our elder brother, He's one who's equal with God. But we must recognise that he's also a man. Often the humanity of Christ is something that's not, not spoken of too, too deeply, not uh, dealt with uh, too readily. But we need to realise that he is now in heaven as a human being. He's on the throne of heaven as a man, Jesus. And he's our elder brother, He's the one who is our high priest, our great high priest who passed through the heavens and he's one who's able to sympathise with us in our weakness. He calls us to come boldly to the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4. He's the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father, forever interceding for us, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. He's the advocate, he's the advocate that we have with the Father. One who offered himself as a propitiation for our sins, 1 John chapter 2. And we see him the mediate, the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. And he's chosen us. He called Mary and he's called each one of us in here who are Christians to join him. To join him in union with Christ. Christ in us and us in Christ that we can come to the Father through the Son, that we can join him in, in, in his eternal resting place. In John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Where, where Jesus is now, on the throne of heaven, we may be also as his as his younger brothers and sisters, so to speak, as his brethren. He's our elder brother. He's entered the throne room of heaven. Hebrews chapter 2, 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's our elder brother. Sometimes we get this view of Jesus, we know about his power, about his dominion, his preeminence, his authority, but sometimes Christians can have this view of judgment, like when we, when we go to meet him, that he's going to be just scouring, we're going to see a scouring face, or why didn't you do this better, why didn't you do that better? But do you know when we go to see Christ, we, we see that face and he looks us in the face. There's a sen- I heard a preacher once say, there's a sense in which he's probably going to be more pleased to see us then we will be to, to see him, so to speak, that he, he loves us. Christ loves us. He loves us enough to lay down his life on the cross. Our elder brother laid his life down for his brethren, for those who are to follow him by faith. I had a friend who passed away last weekend, and he was a dear, godly man. And I was thinking, we found out on Monday, it was, it was sudden, and... Um, and I was just thinking about the reality that now he's now in the presence of Christ. He's now with Christ. He's with this one who we're speaking of today, this one who's risen <clears throat> and ascended uh, into glory. 
and my friend is now with him and beholding uh, him in this glory and, and it's just a wonderful a wonderful reality that each one of us in here that truly know the Lord have been born of the Spirit of God is going to face that we will follow our elder brother into glory so to speak to be held by him and very finally now <clears throat> we see the reign of Christ the victorious King the reign of the Christ who has ascended and finally the reign of the Christ who bids us to go who bids us to go we see here very much so from our account and from the parallel accounts we see the disciples and the ladies being commissioned to go in Mark chapter 16 it says the angel said to them the women don't be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he's risen he's not here see the place where he laid but go and tell his disciples and Peter that's interesting isn't it go and tell his disciples and Peter think about Peter's denial just a few days earlier go and tell his disciples and Peter that that he is going before you into Galilee there you will see him as he said to you so the angels I mean the word angel it's this idea of a messenger um, one who gives a message and the message was go and tell the disciples that he's risen he's not here and then Jesus himself appears to the disciples uh, sorry to the firstly to the ladies and he says go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee Matthew 28 and then we know of the Great Commission Matthew 28 19 that he gives to his people go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son the Holy Spirit and then Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses uh, you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth so the point I'm trying to make is this risen Christ has given his people a commission to go and tell others about the realities of his resurrection about the realities of his death his substitutionary death on the cross the realities of who he is you see Jesus has finished the work again I don't want to make too much of the imagery that we see here in the passage today but you go into the tomb you see the grave clothes lying and you see the, the handkerchief that was around the head folded up and placed upon the upon the side you see a picture of Jesus is known as the head of the church and we are the body the head the handkerchief around the head is now folded the work's been completed it's neatly done it's put away and we as the body have got work to do Jesus has given us work to continue on with yes the work of the cross is completed it is finished to tell us die but he's called us as his body to go therefore and to tell other people about this reality of the saving power of God in the finished work and person of Jesus Christ there's work that needs to be done why did Mary mistake Jesus I'm going to finish now why did he mis why did why did she mistake mistake Jesus as a gardener that's interesting isn't it there's a there's a tomb that's clearly in a garden he must have maybe she had her eyes full of tears and it was just like oh yeah he might be a gardener but again without reading too much into this maybe there was something he was doing that signified gardening maybe there was something that he w that was making her think oh this man's a gardener he was doing something he's in a garden right now there's another garden that we know of in scripture where things went really bad the garden of Eden where the first Adam failed his role to take dominion and he fell from from grace and the, and the world came under a curse and now we see Christ in this garden this one who's won the victory this one who's completed the work that was needed to be done this one who's made all things new this one who didn't fail this one who resisted temptation and followed through with his father's will this Christ calls us and bids us as his people to go into this garden of the world so to speak to take dominion to sow the seed of his word to see the seed watered in prayer and in love as we go and we take the gospel to the world around us today Mary here was called and she went and she told the disciples the disciples were called and they went and told the world told the world of this risen Savior may we be a people that would experience the call of Christ in our own lives if that hasn't happened for you if you've not truly been 
experience that call of God in Christ, I'd encourage you to look to him as Mary did. Maybe we're bleary-eyed, maybe we're confused, maybe we're, we're, we're doubtful, maybe we're, we're, we're discouraged, maybe we're under trials and temptations, but Jesus is there for us to look to, to turn to, that we may hear him call our name and that we may join with Mary in saying, Rabboni, teacher, send me, send me. So there's, there's the message for this morning. Let's just pray, shall we? As we consider these things, let's pray.